name is Dawn Matthews and welcome to this series on computer hardware. During our last few lessons we focused on input devices and output devices, but did you know you get devices which can be both? By the end of this lesson you should be able to identify some common devices that are used for both input and output and explain how these specialized input-output devices are used in everyday life. Why would you need a device that is both input and output? Having one device that does both input and output means that you don't have two separate devices connected to your computer system. Also having one device serving both functions is often a cheaper option. One of the most common input-output devices is the modem. I'm sure you heard this word before. Let's explain what it is. The most common kind of modem is a hardware device used to connect a computer to a telephone line. You will use a modem whenever you connect to the internet or send a fax from your computer. Why do you need a modem? Why can't you just connect your computer directly into the telephone? To answer this question, we need to understand that computers and telephones transmit information using different kinds of signals. A telephone uses an analog signal and a computer uses a digital signal. These are like two different languages. The computer can't speak telephone and the telephone can't speak computer. Something has to act as a translator for them. This is where the modem comes in. So, if you send an email to your friend, that email starts as a digital signal from your computer. This digital signal is changed by your modem into an analog signal that is then sent over the phone lines. At the computer on the other end, there's another modem. This receives the analog signal from the telephone line and converts it into a digital signal which is inputted into your friend's computer. The computer processes this signal and your friend can now read your email. When your friend replies to your email, their message goes through their modem, over the phone lines and into your modem. Your modem converts the message and inputs it into your computer for you to read. Can you see that the modem is sending and receiving data? so it is both an input and output device. The first modem was invented in 1958, but it was not until the late 1980s that they became cheap and small enough for home use. Mm. But how do we connect a modem? Let me show you. To connect the modem to your computer, you first need to plug it into a port at the back of the computer. A port is where a device connects to the motherboard. So this modem fits into this port, like that. If you look at the modem, you'll see that it also has a cable which connects to the telephone socket in the wall. So our modem is connected to the CPU and to the phone line. Bear in mind that this is an external modem. You also get an internal modem that fits inside the computer case. All you have to do with an internal modem is connect a phone line directly to the computer port and you're ready to go. When you connect to a phone line with a dial-up modem, you will hear some peculiar scratching noises. These sounds are coming out of the modem speaker. It's actually the noise of two modems talking to each other converting the analog phone signal back into digital information and vice versa. This electronic greeting between two modems is sometimes called a digital handshake. The invention of the modem has opened up many new and exciting possibilities for us. Without the modem, we wouldn't have the internet, online shopping or email and don't forget the really important stuff like the weather forecasting toaster and the automatic part that fills up with water when you phone it. Strange as it sounds, Archie is quite right. There is a bar that can fill itself, which is output, if you send a signal input over phone lines. 
and there's also a toaster that forecasts the weather. It's called Toasty and it was invented by a student called Robin Southgate. The toaster has an internal modem inside it and each morning before it makes the toast, it dials into the weather bureau to check the weather, which is input. It then toasts an image of the sun or clouds onto the bread output so that when you eat your toast, you will see what the weather for the day will be. Although a weather forecasting toaster and an automatic bath are pretty way out, it does show that having computers that can talk to each other is changing the way we live. Having computers that communicate has also changed the way that medicine is being practiced. Today, hospitals are full of many different kinds of computerized medical equipment. For example, there's an electronic device that checks blood pressure. This device is placed on a patient's arm and electronically monitors their heartbeat. It also displays the blood pressure readings so that a nurse or doctor can read it. So, this blood pressure machine is both an input and an output device. There's also an X-ray machine which uses a form of radiation energy to take pictures of your bones. It then outputs a 2D outline of your skeleton on a built-in screen. Once again, because it creates data and displays information, it is both an input and output device. And these are just two examples of medical computers. More and more, the medical field relies on computing devices to save our lives. Now, let's move on and have a look at another input-output device, CD writers and or DVD writers. When you go into a video shop, about half the movies available to rent are on DVD and the other half on VHS tapes. This is a clear indication that DVDs are replacing VHSs as the best way to watch videos at home. You see, VHS is an old format that uses magnetic tape to store the picture and sound information. VHS uses an analog signal to carry this information. DVDs, on the other hand, are digital which makes them much more reliable than VHS tapes. DVDs and CDs are very similar. Both store information digitally and both are plastic discs of the same size. So what's the difference between CDs and DVDs? A DVD can store a lot more information than a CD. In fact, a DVD holds about seven times more information. This means that a DVD can hold a whole movie while a CD can only hold a few minutes. A CD or DVD writer burns information onto a CD or DVD. Burning is a term that means recording or inputting information onto a disc. The CD or DVD writer can also read information off these discs. This is why we say that CD and DVD writers are both input and output devices. In the beginning, these writers were very, very expensive. But now they are more affordable and are commonly available in shops. You even get writers that can rewrite CDs and DVDs, which means that you can use the same disc over and over again. Great! So my computer can burn music CDs and DVD movies with a writer. Awesome! Yes, you can. But remember, the copyright laws make this illegal. Oh yes, um, of course. Let's see if we can squeeze in one or two other input-output devices before we go. Can you think of any? Um, there's just too many. Well, the one I'm thinking of is the touch screen. We use the touch screen to enter information into the computer and the results are then displayed back onto the same screen. This is input and output. Oh yes, and then there was the PDA. Excellent! The PDA screen can also be used to enter information and display information. So, it's an input-output device. Well, that's all we have time for today. Let's take a look at your task. Make a list of common input-output devices and say what purpose each serves. 
Draw a diagram to show why a modem is both an input and output device. And describe a useful input-output device that has not yet been invented. Thanks for watching and don't forget to visit our website for more information. Join us next time when we'll be looking at storage devices. Till then, keep well.